to understand that the means that we use need to be congruent with the ends that we would like to achieve. So in other words, yelling at your employees to give better service to the customer doesn't make any sense. Business as art. But here's where I want to start, Ari, a lapsed anarchist's guide. Here at the Inner MBA, what can we learn from anarchist philosophy that will help us in business? Thanks, Tammy. It's almost like you're on radio and a podcaster. That was awesome. <laughs> almost like um, Yeah, I'm honored to be here. Hi, everybody. It's a it's an honor to everything Tammy said about it being an honor it goes right back the other way. Uh, it sounds true. Does awesome work. I am a regular listener to the podcast, and uh, I appreciate deeply all the positive stuff that you all contribute to the world. So honored to be here. Anarchism. Um, I think the, the short answer is a lot. Uh, let me tell you more because it seems incongruous to the casual listener for most people, at least if they don't know a lot about anarchism. So I am from Chicago and I came to Ann Arbor to go to school at University of Michigan, where I studied Russian history, very important major for the food business. And I <laughs> spent a lot of time in that work studying anarchism. Uh, we ha it's not why I came here and I didn't know it when I arrived, but U of M has the largest anarchist collection in the country. It's on the seventh and now eighth floor of the graduate library. So I used to go up there and study all these, read these like obscure pamphlets from 1900. And I was very drawn to it for any number of reasons. Um, and you know, on we went, right? If you, I don't know if there's any other history majors on the call, but if you have a history degree, there isn't really anything you could do with it except get more degrees, which is what I was supposed to do, but I wasn't quite ready for that. So I ended up staying in town here in Ann Arbor and getting a job as a dishwasher uh, in a restaurant, which is how I got into food. So no lifelong dreams of culinary activity or business at all. I just really kind of lucked out in that in that regard. But long story short, uh, let's see, three, four years later, when I started, I had moved up into managing kitchens and I started to get into a leadership role. I hadn't really paid a whole lot of attention to anarchism, but I had internalized a lot of the ideology. And uh, I tried in, in the belief people would just do the right thing. I sort of tried leaving them all alone, which completely didn't work. And uh, so for, for years, I Afterwards, I just started to study more, I don't know, mainstream, progressive mainstream business uh, and leadership books and stuff. And I, I started to refer to myself as a lapsed anarchist because I still believed in it, but I didn't practice. Fast forwarding 20, I don't know, five years, 30 years later, uh, while I was working on part one of that book series that Tammy kindly mentioned, which is building a better business, I got asked to speak at the Jewish Studies Department by Deborah Dash Moore, who was the head of the department. And the year before, she had seen an essay I wrote about the history of Jewish rye bread. Nice long 10,000 word essay, because I like that kind of stuff. And she said, I want to call the talk Rye Bread and Anarchism. And I was like, sure, sounds cute, awesome. It's like nine months away, we'll deal with it when we get closer. So when I got to like three months out, though, I realized I was in trouble because although at business conferences, when I would speak and I would reference the anarchists, most people just chuckle nervously thinking of rock throwing and I would move on and that, that was the end of it. But I realized going to speak to the Jewish studies department, these are people who study all these people I studied for a living and they know way more than I ever knew. And if I didn't get my act together, I was going to look like an idiot in front of them. So I dug all my old books out and I started to reread all these people who had inspired me when I was in school, Emma Goldman, Peter Kropotkin. I don't know if any of these names ring any bells for anybody. They probably don't, but they're quite famous in that world. Emma Goldman was called the most dangerous woman in America by J. Edgar Hoover and was kicked out of the country in 1919. But anyway, so I started to reread all these books and I was blown away uh, for two main reasons. Uh, number one, I was surprised to see how much Paul and I had recreated of a lot of this ideology or philosophy without really realizing we were doing it in the way that we were running the organization. And then B, what really blew my mind is so much of what they were writing about circa 1900 and going to jail for 
is now called progressive business. So they wrote about spirit. They wrote about getting rid of hierarchy. They wrote about freedom and free choice, which is now called self-organizing work teams, flattening organizational hierarchy. Uh, they, they wrote about people need to believe in what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. So then I just did what all history majors really know how to do, study more. <laughs> And so I just immersed myself uh, and I haven't stopped. And so I, I guess the answer is directly, there's a ton of the philosophy of anarchism. And of course, there's a thousand ways to apply anarchism like anything else. But in my construct, a thousand ways to apply it. Uh, some of the premier ones or most important ones for me are understanding that hierarchy can be helpful operationally, but there's no correlation to people's value in the world based on their position, age, race, gender, or anything else, uh, and learning to stop thinking hierarchically, which so much of the world does, and so most of us are trained to do so, so uh, constantly that we don't even know we're doing it. So to learn to stop thinking hierarchically, I can talk more about that. To, to choose to believe that everybody is a, is a, pos is a uh, intelligent, creative human being that can do great things. Uh, to understand that the means that we use need to be congruent with the ends that we would like to achieve. So in other words, yelling at your employees to give better service to the customer doesn't make any sense, uh, et cetera. So those are just some of the highlights, but, but anarchism is generally assumed to be chaos and violence. It's actually the opposite of that. It's a, it's a philosophy or a belief system uh, that is actually apolitical. So it's actually the opposite of politics. All right, so just one thing to, to clarify. One thing to clarify. You, you know, I, I got a little confused as you were talking about hierarchy because it seemed like you thought, yes, there's a place for it operationally, but mm -hmm. you're trying to underscore every human being's value. So where mm -hmm. is the place, though, for hierarchy in Zingerman's yeah. collection of businesses? Well, we're, A, we're highly imperfect, so we're trying to figure all this out, just like all of you are. B, I think the, the, the thing to distinguish, thank you for the good question, is between operational hierarchy and then assigning identity or value based on hierarchy and or, and or thinking hierarchically. So uh, whatever metaphor you want to use, if you're in an orchestra, there's a conductor makes total sense but the point of this is that the conductor is not a better human being than the guy who carries the bass drum onto the stage and for all i know the bass drum carrier is just as creative as the conductor it's just they have different jobs if you're playing football there's a quarterback but it doesn't make the quarterback any smarter or anything else so it totally makes sense from a, an organizational standpoint on shift or whatever that somebody's in charge, but it's just understanding that everybody else's perspective is equally important in the bigger yeah. picture of things. And then thinking hierarchically uh, is what leads us to ask questions all the time, like what's the most important thing? What's the single thing we need to know? What's the number one thing? Like those are all coming out of hierarchical thinking. And I actually have tried to retrain my brain to go in the other direction. So that means you're, you might say something like, what are all the things we need to know? Or what are all the different perspectives we could have about X, Y, Z? Yeah, so it's, I'm sure you've touched on it in various formats already, but it's one of the differences like in, in a healthy ecosystem, everything matters, right? And so, hierarchy would lead you to believe that bees were almost irrelevant in nature because by weight they're so insignificant and they don't seem to do anything and yet they're super critical so in in the same way in the organization i mean everything matters we can't do everything well at once but it's still important to understand that everything matters and that everything is interrelating right so that the the greeting that uh the host gives at the roadhouse tonight could impact a $50,000 cater or a mail order corporate gift sale. I mean, so these tiny things can have enormous impact and trying to honor that value is really important. You're, you're making some really important points and I'm having you know these aha moments as I'm listening to you at the same time. Uh, people at Zingerman's and in the collection of businesses are probably paid uh, yeah. a different amount and there's probably people at the top of the salary hierarchy 
that's a distinct from an entry level employee. So, I mean, there are yeah. these kinds of, you know, higher. A absolutely. I, I am not yeah. in the least maintaining that we've attained perfection. In fact, one of my big learnings of the last few years was that nature is imperfect in my childhood pursuit of perfectionism turns out to be the pursuit of the unnatural, which isn't real smart. <laughs> but but uh, no, absolutely. I mean, we're trying, you know, we're living in the real world. And so this is, uh, it's what uh, Howard Ehrlich, interesting anarchist from Baltimore called transfer society. It's how do you live in the real world while pursuing this uh, amazing vision of the future. So absolutely. I mean, one can make an argument for people all getting paid the same. The problem is you're going to have a hard time hiring a, a CFO if they're paid $15 an hour. So we need to live in a real world and try to keep it manageably equitable. Uh, and we do a lot of things around open book management so that at least people can participate in the finances of the business in a meaningful way that, that I think alters some of that conversation. Now, in the introduction, I said that you're someone who I think looks at business as a, a type of art form. You could say uh, also studies deeply the philosophy. So it's like a philosophical art form, if you will. How do you see that? Do you see yourself as an artist, a philosopher? What, what do you think? Uh, I see myself as a line cook that's, <laughs> that's doing okay. Um, I mean that, but I, 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 but, the, but the direct answer to your question is yes, I, I started to, to realize that business and, or, and I, when I say business, I nonprofit and for-profit are essentially interchangeable in my mind. They're just different financial metrics. Uh, but, um, business or organizational life are, like art or music or poetry. And I start, I wrote a pamphlet about it called The Art of Business, uh, which is a conversation getting into this idea. I really believe if we look at our lives like we're making a painting, then we start to realize that every brushstroke matters. And that whatever the way that you or I talk to the cashier at the drugstore on the way home is a brushstroke on the painting of our life. And once it's on there, it's not coming off. Right. And, you know, whatever metaphor you want to use, if you look at it like we're making, I've, I've, you know, found myself giving talks to whatever 18 year olds, high school. And I don't, I mean, I, we have awesome 17, 18 year olds that work with us. So it's not a cut on it, but just people in, you know, in school and they're kind of looking at me like I'm crazy. And I was just like, look, I mean, I just look at it like I'm making music that 50 years after I leave the planet, people are still going to be listening to. So make it good. And in that sense, yes, I think it is beauty and art. Uh, John O'Donohue, whose work I really love, who you uh, interviewed, um, who passed away in 08, I think, uh, he said that the world is suffering from a crisis of ugliness. And I, I think, and this was said long before the current political yeah. construct that we're existing in. So I, I think that he's right. And and I, I don't look at life as a zero sum game, but I think beauty and ugliness is a zero sum game. And so the more beauty we a put into the world and the more beauty we train ourselves, as he said, to see, uh, then the, the better, the healthier, the more positive place it's going to be. One of our participants, Ari, Oscar from Madrid wrote in and said, will you please ask Ari, what do you believe are the core principles of good leadership? Well, to the earlier point, I mean, I don't know that there's any one thing, but uh, there's an essay in part one of the book uh, called 12 Natural Laws of Business. It's my belief that all healthy organizations, whether it's us or sound true, sounds true, or many of you or a basketball team, or an orchestra or a brownie troupe, uh, when, when, it, when, the, when the organization is healthy and doing well, it's honoring these natural laws. So they're, they're kind of like gravity. Uh, you can not like them, <laughs> but they remain true. So like as a history major, I, I too really honestly don't quite understand why gravity works the way it does, but I'm very clear what will happen to my phone if I let go and I will make my decisions accordingly. So these natural laws, uh, my experience of them is that interviews with all healthy leaders, with all great athletes, with all great musicians, they will touch on almost all of these in their own words and in their own way. 
So I really have come to believe if we live in harmony with those natural laws, then we're going to do pretty well. Um, and if we violate the natural laws, then I think we get the same sort of uh, ecological negative ecological impact that we have on the planet when we violate nature and we destroy natural resources and, and we see what's happening with that. Give, give us a sense of what these natural laws are like. So, give so the, the first one on the list is about visioning, uh, which is a huge piece of how we work. But uh, it's, just, it's just true. I mean, everybody who's attaining greatness, and by greatness, I mean of their own choosing, not by making the most money, unless that's what they choose. But anybody who's attaining greatness, whether it's in parenting or a poetry or professional basketball player, they, they all have imagined, envisioned, whatever word you want to use, where they're going. Um, and, and this is, uh, I mean, you can go back to the Bible, you can find it in Emma Goldman, uh, Michael Jordan, I grew up in Chicago, Michael Jordan used to say he could see the ball going through the hoop before it left his hand. Uh, everybody who starts a business, including me and Paul, even though we didn't write down a vision the way we now would do it, we had one in our head. I mean, we knew what we wanted to achieve. Uh, I, I think it's a natural human process that every three-year-old knows how to do, but society pressures us out of it. Uh, Rollo May, the psychologist, said the opposite of courage is not con uh, cowardice, it's conformity. And I think there's enormous pressure to fit in, enormous pressure to follow what the people around us say, what the press says, what our parents say. Um, this is a lot of what anarchism was reacting to, is encouraging us to really walk our own path. And so I think we all know how to vision, but we get trained how to not do it. So this is coming back to it with an actual recipe and a process. So that's number one. Uh, some of the other ones, uh, one of my favorites, number nine, is uh, success means you get better problems. I used to think success would mean I had no problems till one day I realized it would mean I was dead and I didn't want that problem. So like if you try to work in a non-hierarchical way, a really good problem is the busboy is going to tell me what we're doing wrong. <clears throat> in a more traditional organization, he or she would never say a word. Mm -hmm. I prefer the problem of them speaking up critically than of them shutting up and disengaging from the organization. Uh, number 12 is that healthy organizations, uh, the people in them are more appreciative and they're having more fun. I mean, and this is, it's just true. Uh, and I used to think that they were, it was sort of obvious. Well, of course they're having more fun, they're successful, but then I realized it was iterative. So yes, it's true. They're having more fun and they're more appreciative because they're succeeding, but it's equally true that they're succeeding because they're more appreciative and having more fun. Uh, and, and I think that's just universal truth. <laughs>